are very happy today and for many reasons, but one is because we have yet another amazing seminar lined up today. And for today we have a presentation by our very own Dr. Mrs. Mercy Akrofiansa. And we also have uh, a very distinguished chair today. Uh, I was going to go through his entire profile, but if I did, it would take all of the one hour and a half. Uh, just in short, he is, this is Reverend Dr. Samuel Obin Mantiao, a lawyer and lecturer here at uh, the Ghana Faculty of Law, or School of Law as it is now, that he holds a PhD in law from the University of Ghana and remains the first and only PhD graduate produced ever by the University of Ghana in its 65 year history. <laughs> he holds two Masters of Laws degrees, uh, LLM degree in intellectual property, and he has been a visiting scholar at many prestigious institutions. He has attended many conferences, workshops, and seminars. He is married and has a daughter, and with no further ado, we will introduce you to the man, Reverend Dr. Samuel Obin Matio, and he will have to. Good morning, all. Um, Dr. Obin, thanks so much for the very nice and uh, <laughs> I'm blushing. We are most welcome to today's session. Um, I think we all know who the presenter is today, but the privilege is mine to briefly. Uh, introduce her before she starts the delivery. Um, the presenter for today is a married woman um, who is very fluent in many languages. Apart from English, she speaks French, Spanish, the Akan language, letter. Um, she obtained her PhD in 2009 from the University of Manchester, UK. Um, she has an MPhil from the University of Ghana and other degrees. She started working here in the University of Ghana in 2001. And at present, she's a research fellow with the IES. She has a number of research experience spanning a broad spectrum of areas um, communication strategies, uh, linguistic description, difficulties in reading English, um, aspect of letter technology, aspects of letter grammar, uh, which was part of her PhD thesis, um, language contact phenomena in a multilingual community, and uh, a number of uh, other activities, including postdoctoral research uh, endeavors. She has been awarded a number of fellowships and awards, including the Doctoral Research Award by the Ghana Education Trust Fund, Get Fund, from 2006-2009, um, the Postdoctoral Award by the American Council for Learned Societies under the African Humanities Program in 2011. She's affiliated with the Linguistics Association of Ghana, um, the World Education, and the World Congress of African Linguistics. Her research interests span broad areas. Um, adult literacy, language use in various domains, an aspect of which should be treated as new today. Grammar of less studied languages, language contact phenomena, among several others. She has numerous publications, and uh, given the time constraints that we have, uh, it, may, it may not be possible to go through all of them, and that speaks volumes about her uh, prolific activities in publishing. Um, she has over um, 15 articles in peer review journals uh, and several other writings. Um, the most recent among them uh, in 2014, this year, is expressing possession in Guan languages the letter examples, which was published in the African Studies and Language Production as a reader. Uh, there are several others. 
and uh, I think without much ado, uh, I will now introduce to us all the presenter for the day, and she's no other person than our dear Dr. Mrs. Mercy Akrofi Ansa. very much. Yeah, this morning I'm presenting to you receiving justice in your language, the role of court interpreters in Ghana. And before I start, I want to issue this disclaimer. The book study on which this presentation is going to be based is purely an academic exercise. The study does not in any way intend to assess the performance of our court interpreters, neither does it reflect on the efficiency or otherwise of the judicial system of Ghana. The official permission to undertake the study was granted by the judicial secretary of the judicial service of Ghana. Now to begin, we have the interpreter at work. I'm not sure if you can see so clearly. Now the interpreter is expected to communicates in the first person, that is direct speech. And sometimes there are difficulties associated or challenges associated with this. As you go on, you would understand. Now this is the outline of presentation. Now I'll briefly talk about the motivation, why I decided to do the study, and then I'll present the objectives of the study. And then, language in the Constitution of Ghana, what the Constitution of Ghana says about language rights. Then, there will be some background, relevant background material, definition of some key terms, then the interpreter at work, then the approach I use, the methods I use in collecting data, and findings and discussions. I'll conclude, and then, I would uh, make some recommendations. All right. Now, in any multilingual community, interpretation is very crucial. I've been um, watching how interpretation is done in various domains. Now, we all know that uh, most of the time at church, there is interpretation for the sake of um, members who cannot or do not understand English or some other language. There is interpretation at the hospitals and in various domains. So I decided that I was going to investigate how interpretation is done in the law courts. Now, I got this idea after I had listened to a conference presentation on language use in the courts in South Africa, which was very interesting. So I told myself to investigate, to find out um, the phenomenon in Ghana. So I went searching for literature to find out if anything at all has been done on language use in the courts. And somehow, to my disappointment, there was nothing. I don't find anything. Maybe there's something, but it hasn't been documented. But as far as I know, there isn't uh, anything done on language use in the courts. So I decided to go out to investigate. And most importantly, how interpreters use language in their way, in the context of multilingualism in Ghana. So I have uh, the following objectives as how to, to investigate the use of language by district court interpreters in the context of multilingualism in Ghana, and the challenges faced by the interpreters, and then finally to propose some measures to overcome some of these challenges. Now the language rights. The 1992 Constitution of the Republic of Ghana, Article 14, Section 2, says the person who is arrested, restricted, or detained shall be informed immediately 
in a language that he understands of the reasons for his arrest, restriction, or detention, and of his right to a lawyer of his choice. So the law makes provision for um, litigants to use the language that they best understand it, they can communicate in. Furthermore, Article 19, subsection 2, or section 2, a person charged with criminal offense shall be informed immediately in a language that he understands and in detail of the nature of the offense charge. And then H says, the person shall be permitted to have without payment by him the assistance of an interpreter where he cannot understand the language used at the trial. So the litigants have the right to use interpreters so that they can be linguistically present at their own trials. So as I said, um, to date I have not found any um, literature or work done on language use in our courts. But it may interest you to know that in South Africa there are several studies, several studies have been done. And I'm sure it's because of their peculiar political circumstances and um, the fact that they have 11 official languages, but these languages do not have the same status. Only English and Afrikaans are recognized in their courts as languages of record. Then one may ask, so what happens to the nine other languages? that the constitution recognizes. And so they rely a lot on interpreters. And the studies or the literature that I found um, seem to be saying that um, because many people who cannot speak English or Afrikaans have to rely on the services of interpreters, sometimes justice is miscarried. So there are miscarriages of justice. Therefore, there's a need for competent interpreters. The work by Libacy 2012, also based in South Africa, is on the defined role of court interpreters. And according to him, there's no legislation that clearly defines the role of an interpreter in the South African court. And sometimes interpreters perform other duties of court officials. And therefore, there's a risk of miscarriage of justice. Then, Mukherjee, 1999, also talks about the nature of verbal interaction in the courtroom, including court interpreting. And he states that the small performance of the interpreter is a result of poor training and lack of proper definition of the interpreter rule. Hans 2012 talks about the importance of language and its use in law. And he says that the need, there's a need for African languages to develop a modern scientific vocabulary. By so doing, the work of interpreters become easier and more reliable. Erasmus 1998 also says that the need to establish translation and interpreting services for local government in the context of multilingualism in South Africa. So all these researchers conclude that if there aren't enough interpreters or there aren't efficient interpreters, there's a likelihood that um, justice will be miscarried. Now, before I go on, I want to uh, distinguish um, who the interpreter is and who the translator is. Most of the time, we tend to um, confuse the two terms. An interpretation is an oral activity, whereas translation is a written activity. There, Interpreter doesn't have the luxury of time, unlike the translator. The interpreter must doesn't have the time to think over whatever 
interpretation he must give, whatever rendition he must give. As a translator, he has a text before him and he has time to go over whatever he has put down. Now in Ghana, there is a handbook for interpreters which was published in 2011. This was developed by the Visual Training Institute at JTI, which offers guidelines to ensure uniformity of approach interpretation. And every interpreter is expected to have this book and uh, to, to read and to understand and to apply, to go according to the guidelines. But as you go on, you would know whether they really have uh, um, the handbooks, but the handbooks are really available to these interpreters. Yeah, as I said, the JTI, the JTI is a judicial training institute that trains judges, magistrates, and court administrative personnel of the judicial service of Ghana. Now, in Ghana, the district courts belong to the category of lower courts, of lower courts and they constitute the largest number of courts in Ghana. Each district has at least one court, and the district or the magistrate court has a jurisdiction to try both civil and criminal cases. Actually, my work is based on the magistrate courts. And so who qualifies as a court interpreter? Now, I came across this advert and I found it very interesting. So I decided to put up here, let's look at the advert, let's look at the required skills, and let's see whether um, the judicial cell is really going by um, whatever the required skills are. It reads, applications are invited from suitably qualified persons to be employed as court interpreters. Applicants must indicate clearly which of the 10 regions they prefer to be posted to. And I can assure you that if, <laughs> if people were given the chance to, to decide where they want to work, then most of them would say they would want to be in Accra. So then what happens to the other regions? Okay, and let's look at the required skills or experience. It says GCE O or A level or SSSCE, Computation, Computer Literacy in MS Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Assets. And then excellent oral communication skills in at least three local Ghanaian languages in the region of choice for the age not below 25 years. Okay. Then according to the interpreter's handbook, when interpreters are going to be recruited, <coughs> there are three criteria that they look out for. The skill level, the vacancies available, and the suitability. For the skill level, the applicant must possess a degree or a diploma in interpreting and in interpreting, and it must also be based on judicial service assessment. You must also possess a judicial service assessment grade. Now, degree or diploma in interpreting, I'm not sure if, um, well, let's continue. <laughs> For vacancies, availability of vacancies. So if there's a vacant position somewhere, then somebody could be employed there. Then suitability, based on language repertoire of the applicant. So what is court interpretation? This involves, according to John 2008, it involves a linguistic and cultural performance whose objective is to overcome the language barriers and cultural misunderstandings. So this tells us that Interpretation is not just a matter of um, being proficient in a particular language. It also involves knowledge of the culture of the people. Because we know that language and culture 
are tied. You know, at the center of every uh, culture is language. So it's not just a matter of knowing the language, but the culture of the people is also, knowing the culture of the people is also very crucial. Now for the court interpreter, he becomes both the speaker and the hearer in the reverse order. So for instance, at the court, the prosecutor um, addresses the witness. It's the duty of the interpreter, that is, if the witness decides to, the witness cannot speak English in, in Ghana. If the witness cannot speak English and he opts to speak in his uh, mother tongue, then the interpreter must interpret. So the prosecutor begins by addressing the witness, um, bringing out the, the facts of the case, and it's the duty of the interpreter to tell the witness exactly what the prosecutor has said. In this case, the interpreter is supposed to be just a conduit He's not supposed to um, express any interest. He's not supposed to uh, explain. His duty is simply to tell the witness whatever the prosecutor has said. So the interpreter tells the witness, and then the witness responds in his, his or her mother tongue, the interpreter, and the interpreter speaks back to the prosecutor. So we see that this communication situation is quite complex. It's not like the interpretation, for instance, we have at church, at the church where the interpreter would simply um, listen to the preacher and then tells the congregation and that ends it. In the case of the court interpreter, he has to get back to the source. So it is quite a complex exercise. So the court interpreter performs two functions simultaneously. He's a speaker and hearer in the reverse order. Now he has to be impartial. He has to be accurate. It's very, very important. So the court interpreter must be alert all the time. And as I said, he is just a country. He's expected to use the first person, that is direct speech. And he's not to anticipate what the witness is trying to say. So whether you even know what the witness would want to say, you just have to be patient, listen to the witness, and then say whatever. And the interpreter must go at a pace that the judge or the magistrate is able to record. Now, the language for recording in Ghana is English. So it's the duty of the interpreter to make sure that he tells the magistrate exactly what has been said in English and um, at a pace that he or she can cope with so that he can put down the, the correct um, rendition. And the interpreter is not to accept guests from parties to a case. So the, if you're an interpreter, you have to be very careful. So I realized that during my um, survey, I had tokens for them. And I realized that it was difficult for them to accept it. So I had to explain to them that this is part of the research. I'm not using that to, you know, to bribe or to you know, do any other thing apart from to ensure that the, the work goes on smoothly. Because they are not supposed to accept gifts from parties to a case. Then they are not offer any advice based on experience. They are not expected to make phone calls to parties um, to a case. And then they are not supposed to advise them in any way. Now, to my approach and their methods. Now, I've done this within the framework of Angelili, Angelili 2004, the theory of interpreting. This is just an adaptation. 
she considers interpreting as a very specific type of communicative event, and I'm sure you agree with me, and considers interpersonal, social, and political aspects of interpreting. In the case of court interpretation, it's a complex communicative event, unlike in the area of language and communication, where speech and understanding are carried out separately. Now, before I set out to do this organization, I needed to obtain official permission from the Judicial Secretary of the Judicial Service of Ghana. He is the, um, can say he's the administrator for the Judicial Service. And then I had to be introduced to the various magistrate court registries. I collected the data at the Magina, Accra Central, and the La Magistrates courts. And the survey involved five interpreters who, whom I interviewed and then who also um, responded to some questionnaires. I also interviewed ten magistrates and then I interviewed two lawyers. Then I observed 12 court proceedings. Um, I had to take notes but I couldn't take the notes in the courtroom because it's not allowed. Maybe I could have sought permission, but I didn't want um, the interpreters to know about my presence. Otherwise, um, they wouldn't act naturally. So, most of the time, I try to hide my identity. I'll just sit, just um, anybody would sit in the courtroom. So I didn't take down notes. But what I did was immediately after one session, I quickly get into my car and then try to, you know, take down the notes. Um, whatever I observed, I tried to put um, the notes down. Then for the questionnaire for interpreters, I was interested in the following. I wanted to know about their age and the age range because that could um, affect the way they did their work. I wanted to know the gender, um, how many women, how many men were involved in that kind of work. I wanted to know about their language repertoire, whether that, uh, we have all the languages represented. I wanted to know about the educational background or their qualification. It had anything to do with interpretation their professional training, interpretation, how much they were paid, and then the challenges they faced in their work. And then with the magistrates, I wanted to know the usefulness of the interpreters, how often they use their services, the challenges they have with them, and then there are some suggestions they had for them to improve upon their work, I also wanted to know the language background of the magistrates because I felt that was very important. And then how the thought Ghanaian language proficiency could aid their work. And then I decided to observe, to see the interpreter at work, to observe their challenges and how they collaborate with magistrate, lawyers, and other court officials. Okay, so that is what I found. For the interpreters, the male female ratio was five is to one, so we have many of them being men. And the age range between 25 years to 60 years, the level of education, the lowest, there was um, a few of them had post MSLC, that's the Middle School Level Certificate, Technical Training. And then the higher the first degree, about three of them have first degree as an university, of ed university education. Then the school subjects, what they studied in school included accounting, so that's their background, accounting, auto mechanic engineering, human resource management, law, business, home economics. So apart from one person who said she had done some law, I don't know what kind of law 
he had done some law. All the others didn't have any language background. They didn't have any legal background. So um, that the, the background, the subject they studied in school. And the language repertoire, Gachi, Ewe, Dagbani, Mampusi, Hausa, Dangme, Nanumba, Kupumba, and then of course all of them expected to be uh, to be proficient in English. And there's the presentation. Most of them could speak Akan. We had about 11 of them. Ga, 7, Ewe, 4, Dagbani, 3, Mampusi, 1, Nanumba, 1, Kupumba, 1. Hausa four, then of course all of them said they were proficient in English. So we see that most of them spoke Akan. Now we are in Accra, Accra is um, highly multilingual. A lot of people have Akan, a lot of Akan speakers in Accra. But also we have a, a number of, or many people who would speak um, languages in the northern region and then the Upper East and Upper West regions. And for those languages, we see that there is quite a low representation. So, Dagbani, Mampusi, Nanumba, Kukumba, not many of them. And then for training interpretation, none. So none of them has had any training in interpretation. And their salary ranged between 250 Ghana cities to 1,050 Ghana cities per month. Now, about the challenge, their challenges, I asked them what kind of challenges they face as they did their work. And they said, most the time they were harassed by lawyers and litigants, especially the lawyers. I remember when I interviewed the lawyers, it seemed that none of them is really or was really satisfied with the way interpreters did their work. And I wasn't surprised. <laughs> because you know that they have high stakes in whatever was going on in the courts. So they were never satisfied. So they were often harassed for misinterpretation. And sometimes litigants would also um, accuse them of being biased. Then they also had problems with legal terminologies. So for instance, bail, how do they, what is the equivalent of bail in Akan or Nanumba or Kumba, for instance. Plaintiff, respondent, the gen, exhibit, docket, ex party motion, and so on and so forth. So one interpreter told me that there was a case where um, the accused had asked for, or the lawyer, of the accused had asked for bail. The, bail, the judge or the magistrate granted the bail and he couldn't really explain or interpret properly. So this accused person went and they never saw him back. And when he was rearrested, his explanation was that, well, he didn't understand. He didn't know that he was supposed to go and reappear or report to the police station at the police station from time to time. And that was because the term bill could not be well um, explained or interpreted to the accused. He also said that sometimes there were litigants who had hearing impairment. So if the person may not be deaf per se, but the person could have problems with hearing. And when that happens, give them a tough time to communicate with the litigant. He also said that sometimes they, you have litigants who stammer. And when that happens, the, the, the work becomes very tedious. Sometimes litigants are evasive. They will never get straight to the point. They will go round and round and round and it's difficult to get whatever they are saying to interpret for the magistrate to write. So sometimes there was non cooperation from litigants, yeah, that's refusal to understand the interpretation. And then also sometimes there were frequent interruptions by judges due to misinterpretation. So the magistrate or the judge would have to stop the interpreter 
and um, when he thinks or he or she thinks that all is not well and this normally happens when um, you have a lawyer or a judge who does not speak the law, who does not understand the language of the witness. So he or she has to rely completely on whatever the interpreter is saying. And most of the time they have to rely on lawyers. The lawyers, if there's any lawyer who understands the language, then the judge or the magistrate would have to verify whether whatever the interpreter is saying is, is correct. So you can just imagine. Sometimes there's intimidation, but lawyers have said that. Then there are frequent demands for magistrates for a petition. When the magistrate is not very sure, you keep stopping the interpreter to repeat. And when you have agent witnesses, sometimes they are slow and it makes the work quite tedious. Now about training, they said they complained that they had not had any professional training, that JTR has not held training for interpreters for many years, and that their salaries were inadequate, and sometimes they had accusations from litigants for being biased, and sometimes some of the litigants are emotionally unstable, so that gave them a lot of um, problems. And they have these suggestions to make. The interpreters had the following suggestions to make. They suggested that there should be training for them from time to time. And they also suggested that there should be both of legal terms with the equivalents in the various Ghanaian languages to ease their work. And then they wish they also had office space where they could sit and prepare for their work. And interestingly, some of if one person said, well, I, he thinks that their work is so important, so the government should try to offer scholarship for their children to be educated. And they also wanted the opportunity to travel outside for uh, studies. The magistrate's language repertoire. Yeah, there were, out of the 10, there were two people who spoke only a can. And one of them said that she was once posted to the Volta region. And the only language, language she understands is Akan. So she had to completely depend on the integrity of the, temp of the interpreter. And sometimes she was aided by um, the lawyers. There are four of them who spoke Akan and Ga. Three who spoke Akan, Ewe, and Gan. One person who spoke Akan, Ewe, Gan, and Gwan. And according to this magistrate, the one who's, who is able to speak Akan, Ewe, Gan, and Gwan, sometimes she will just ignore the interpreter. Okay, if this, if the interpreter spoke any of this, like because she was proficient in those languages, she would just ignore whatever they are saying and straight away try to. Uh, um, do the recording go straight into English without relying on the rendition given by the interpreter. Now we can see that none of the northern and upper region languages, regions languages are presented here so far as the, the magistrates are concerned. Yeah, they admitted that interpreters are indispensable to their work and they are satisfied by the performance of some of them but not all of them. And they said that sometimes some of these interpreters are absent-minded. And there was a, a case where one interpreter, according to the magistrate, he's good. But on a particular day, he kept mixing colors and dates and so on. And in court um, proceedings, language is very critical. Every detail, very, very important. So dates, um, numbers, um, colors, all these are very important. But for that particular day, somehow this interpreter was so absent-minded and he kept mixing up all these details. So she decided to ignore him. She cautioned him once, twice, and he persisted. So she just ignored him and decided to, to 
do her own thing. Sometimes these interpreters give our facts that they deem unimportant. They decide that this is unimportant, so they give out the facts. And sometimes they attempt to explain to um, litigants some of the statements that are made by prosecutors and so on, which is not allowed. And some of them also do a literal translation, which makes recording difficult. And for some of them, their English background is not that strong. So they notice that if they have to interpret from English to Ghanaian language, that's easier. But then when they have to interpret from Ghanaian language to English, then that becomes problematic. So it makes reporting quite difficult. Then from my observation, what did I observe? That the interpreter sometimes um, plays multiple roles in the court, which should not be. Sometimes they want to act as counsel. There was a case where two boys had been um, arrested for loitering around um, red circle or so, and during some odd hours. So they were said and then they found certain items of them, they were brought to court. Now, they didn't have any lawyer, so the interpreter wanted to help them. Okay, so when the prosecutor had uh, uh, brought out the charges and so on, this interpreter kept telling them, hey, won't cash it. Or somebody say, 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 won't cash it. You know, and that was very unprofessional. His duty is just to, uh, uh, to communicate whatever has been said and not to help anybody. Now, I also noticed that there's a mixture of direct and reported speech. Now, the interpreter's handbook spells out clearly that the interpreters are supposed to use direct speech. As soon as you um, reported speech, it's like you're adding your voice to uh, um, the proceedings, and that is not what you're supposed to do. You're only a conduit, so use direct speech. For instance, um, if the accused said, I'm not guilty, <coughs> the interpreter is expected to say, in a can, minifo, that's direct speech. But as soon as he says, or say unifo, then that is what's reported speech. He says he's not guilty, and that is not how interpretation must be done in the court. And sometimes there was partial interpretation. For instance, in a particular case, and the magistrate said, did you see the accused climbing over the fence wall? Or you saw him at the site and assumed that he climbed over the fence, the fence wall? The interpreter ignored parts of um, the statement made by the person made by the magistrate. And he just said, or oh, you saw him at the site. And the witness said, I saw him climbing over the wall, my lord. So even in this, case, the magistrate herself did not even realize that the interpretation was only done partially. Sometimes I notice that the interpreters, those who have had some, a number of years of experience, they, they tend to um, take a few things for granted. And instead of interpreting sentence by sentence or in bits, they, they make long utterances, and in a, one particular case, um, the utterances were so long that the judge had to step in a few times to tell him to slow down or to um, make short utterances, and um, because that was making her work very difficult. So. Because the utterances too were so long, I noticed that for the interpreter himself, it was quite difficult for him to interpret. A few times he would close his eyes to try to remember what the witness has said. Now, okay, the magistrates said some of the interruptions, the interruptions when they were unclear about their intention. <coughs> 
they relied on the Ghanaian language proficiency. That was when they were able to speak or understand the language spoken by the witness. And sometimes they consulted lawyers for verification. And then on one occasion, the magistrate tried to help the interpreter, which was quite unprofessional. As I've already said, the interpreter sometimes acts as a clerk. He calls out cases which is unprofessional. And sometimes you find him swearing in the witness, which is also unprofessional. And then the absence of the right interpreter, what is supposed to be done is um, if the court official were to act as an interpreter, he's expected to be sworn in. You don't just jump in and do the work. But in one instance, we had um, those the witness who said he didn't understand Ghana, he was a dark man. I was just wondering. But then you cannot force somebody to speak a language he claims he doesn't. Uh, you know, understand. But I felt that Dangwe and Ga were quite close. That if you spoke Ga, you should be able to understand Dangwe. But this was a witness who said, no, it's only Dangwe, I understand. So, because the interpreter could not speak Dangwe, they had to call one, um, one clerk to come and act as interpreter. And I expected that he would be sworn in, but he just stepped in and then did the work of the interpreter, which is quite unprofessional. Then there was lack of equivalent terminologies that I've already mentioned. For the sake of time, I'll not go over them. And then I also noticed that because of differences in <coughs> language structure, there were problems with interpretation sometimes. For instance, colors. You know, in many in other languages, we have the name of colors for the, the very um, primary, the primary colors, yes, we have terms for them. But when it goes beyond that, then there's a problem. So for colors, for red, black, white, yes. But for others, no. Then there's a problem of the, a challenge of polysemy. Now, in, in law, Murder and manslaughter are two different things. Robbery, unlawful entry, stealing, different things. But for our languages, or in our languages, whether it's murder or manslaughter, is the same way. Whether it's robbery or unlawful entry or stealing, is just one way, one thing. And sometimes this poses uh, problems for uh, the interpreters. And then also, we know that English makes gender distinctions in personal pronouns. There's a he and there's a she. But for most of our languages, we don't make such <coughs> distinctions. So when the interpreter is uh, reporting or interpreting for the magistrates, and um, the witness uses the third person pronoun, for instance, Okoye, Okoye, he went or she went. It's very difficult for the interpreter to interpret whether the person that they are referring to is a man or a woman, let's say he or she, because in many of our languages we don't make such distinctions. And the correct use of tenses, tenses, the correct use of tenses is very crucial interpretation because this could affect the ruling or the judgment or the sentencing that is passed in so many ways. For instance, one witness said, May Kai say, Mr. San Kino. The interpreter said, My Lord, I change the key. These two are very different. So the correct condition should have been, I said I'll change the key. Okay, so tenses, the correctness of tenses is very important. And then also, um, we know that kinship terms vary across languages and cultures. In English, we have terms like cousin, aunt, uncle. In Akan, we don't have um, <coughs> terms for these. Your cousin is your brother or your sister. Your aunt 
is your maternal aunt, she's your brother. Your uncle is your paternal uncle, he's your father, and so on and so forth. So these can present challenges to the interpreters. Now I conclude. Litigants have their right to be linguistically present at their own legal proceedings. The law makes provision for that. And interpreters are to make this possible. It's the work of interpreters to make sure that litigants are linguistically present at their own legal proceedings. But court interpreters face challenges emanating from differences in language structure, lack of professional training, and then also low motivation. A magistrate relies on evidence and the law to arrive at judgment. It is therefore important that challenges have to be addressed to ensure that litigants do really receive justice in their own language. Uh, future research. Now, I believe it will be interesting to also look at language use in our hospitals. In the hospital, who is the interpreter in the consulting room? Do the nurse? And how many languages does the nurse speak, for instance? What are the challenges? What could be the results of misinterpretation in the doctor's consulting room? You can imagine. And I'm just wondering, how are the Cuban doctors faring with regards to language use? In the first place, they don't even speak English, let alone any Ghanaian language. And when they, they, they come to Ghana, most of the time they are sent to the districts where nobody wants to go. And that is where the illiterates are, people who do not understand English. Even if they, they themselves even could speak English. So that is something that um, an area that I would want to look at. Now recommendations. I recommend that only personnel with the requisite qualifications must be employed as interpreters. Attention must be paid to English language proficiency and not only Ghanaian languages. Now in the advert you remember that nothing was mentioned about English language that um, the interpreters or applicants must have some passes in English language. Nothing of the sort is mentioned. But it's important that um, this requirement is emphasized. Interpreters at post need to be given some training from time to time. Those who are already at post must be given some training from time to time. And then there must also be better remuneration for interpreters. Now, the language background of judges and magistrates need to be considered before they are posted, I believe. So that if somebody, a judge or a magistrate, was not proficient in the, the dominant language in the area, the person must not be posted to that area. And also, general language proficiency courses need to be introduced at some point during the professional training of judges and magistrates. And perhaps, our section, the LMD section of IAS, would collaborate with the School of Languages in the University of Ghana to mount a program interpretation for these interpreters. A pool of interpreters with all the languages, especially the dominant ones, must be sent to all the courts. So, for instance, at the Accra Central Court, I suggest that they get a pool of um, interpreters who speak the dominant languages in Accra to be available. Because sometimes the case has to be adjourned because there's nobody to interpret. The judicial service must train or employ French English interpreters. At the moment, there are no French English interpreters. To think that we are surrounded by Francophone countries, I think this is something that has to be looked at. And then there are no, at the moment, there are no sign language interpreters. And I suggest that the service also employ sign language interpreters. I hope to put these recommendations together to present the judicial secretary and be copied to the JTI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. and Mrs. I think that was very stimulating.
meeting and uh, very informative. We will now um, open the floor for a few questions and uh, I believe she'll be glad to respond. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, thank you very much. I found it very interesting and enjoyable and I think it's about time somebody worked on this topic. Um, I think you're right that there's no literature on uh, interpreting in the courts. But I believe uh, Professor Yanka did some work on language and interpreting in Parliament. And possibly, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure whether anybody has done it on the district assemblies, but I know it, it has been talked about quite a lot. And although, of course, Parliament's different from court, still it's related because it's all involved with legal access to legal rights. Um, so I, I would suggest you might like to look for that. Um, another, another sort of part comment, part question. Although nobody, I don't think, has ever researched this area, uh, that is the courtroom, people have talked about it. And I remember sometime mentioning to a lawyer friend the whole topic and whether, whether it was a problem. And she said that she thought that when it came to justice, what mattered was whether you had a lawyer or not, and whether you knew what was going on <laughs> was secondary. I don't know, I find that, a, it, that might depend actually on the level of the court, but maybe you'd like to comment on that. Thank you. Um, Doc, I'm very glad you regarded gender in your study. My question has to do with, in case a presiding judge could speak the local language the parties involved in the litigation, is an interpreter still needed? And um, uh, this is not a question per se. I think there's a lot of problem with, uh, with the local languages we speak, and we are having a lot of negative effects because of that. And I was thinking, I know with the English people, they introduce new vocabs with time to time. Uh, is it possible the stakeholders of our Ghanaian languages could do the same thing for us, like the color issue that you were talking about? If we could have words to uh, describe new colors like pink and the rest, I think it would be an improvement. Thank you. Okay, uh, I wanted to thank you for a very exciting uh, presentation. Uh, I had a question as to, I'm not sure if you're at liberty to say, but if in your opinion uh, any judgments were significantly altered due to the interpreter that you thought, in your opinion, that because the interpretation wasn't given in a particular way, this person was pronounced guilty or innocent or anything like that. Uh, also, I was thinking about the Nelson Mandela incident where they had an interpreter who was making things up and delirious. <laughs> you mentioned that there are no sign language interpreters. Did you see anything uh, not close to that level of incompetence, but did you see anything where, again, you thought that this person was not doing a good job and had a very significant impact on how the court proceedings went? Um, I want to congratulate you for venturing to this area of research and it is very critical. My question though is, are you concerned about the training? Are there opportunities for them for us to train these people? Both the lawyers in terms of linguistics or language as well as potential intelligence. Thank you very much. Uh, let me take the last one first. With regards to training for the lawyers and the interpreters, at the moment, um, I know there is a course on interpretation at the School of Languages here, but it's at the master's level here on campus. There used to be a course in, um, in translation, but now there's no more at the School of um, Languages in town, yeah, the of languages in town. So I believe that um, something has to be done, some training has to be organized for these interpreters to begin with. 
Now, the Judicial Training Institute has the responsibility of training court officials. But for a number of years now, nothing of the sort has been done. And I think that it's important that they see to this. So as I said, I'll be sending some recommendations or the proposal to the Judicial Secretary, and I'm going to include this. I mentioned it whilst I was doing my um, data collection, and one lawyer said, well, even if you send the recommendations, you'll be told that there's no money. <laughs> but I think something can be done. Even here at the Institute of African Studies, there was a time we were planning to um, mount courses for the public. So maybe we, it's something we can consider. The language, literature, and drama section, we can consider to put something together in collaboration with the School of um, Languages on campus that courses, short courses, interpretation can be run for these interpreters. For the lawyers, um, I believe that, as I suggested, that at a certain point in their training, they must be, uh, there must be some course in um, language proficiency, Ghanaian language proficiency for them. And I think that is what we try to do here at the undergraduate level, in a way that um, students are encouraged to learn some language. But it's not everybody who has opportunity to learn the language anyway. So I would propose that for the, law for the lawyers, the magistrates, and the judges, uh, learning a language, some languages, Ghanaian languages, is crucial to the, their work. And something has to be done about that. For, now let me go to Dr. Kambon's um, question. Whether I observed any miscarriage of justice due to wrong interpretation, no. No. Um, you know that um, in our law courts, it takes quite a while for judges to really arrive at um, the judgment. Okay, it takes quite a long time. They keep adjourning, adjourning, adjourning. And for the period that I did the study, I, there was no instance where I really uh, observed a judgment, judgment being passed or sentences being passed and whether a wrong interpretation might have affected the sentence or the judgment. But it could, it could happen, it's, it's likely. Now, I read some cases, I read about some cases, not here in Ghana, but in America, where um, the litigant or the accused had to appeal later when he got to know that <laughs> there had been misinterpretation. But here in Ghana, everything goes. Now, people don't, many times, people don't even know their rights. No. In America and elsewhere, um, the, the um, journalists will take up such issues and then comment on them. And maybe the lawyers of the accused would also, will also inform him that this and that and that went wrong with interpretation. And based on that, they go for appeal. But here in Ghana, it doesn't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's been anything of the sort, anything of the sort has ever been reported. And then let me go to Prof. Dakubu's, um, it was a comment or a question, I don't know if anything. That um, the, the outcome of a case really depends on whether somebody has a lawyer or not. That's what a lawyer said to me, but I saw it. Well, maybe he was expressing his own interest. <laughs> but you know that the lawyer stands for the, the litigant or the accused or whatever. So I think a lot will depend on the lawyer. But it's the right of the litigant to also know whatever is, you know, whatever transpired. <coughs> I think I'm done with the first set of questions. If I would just come in briefly, um, I, I know at the end I will give some summation, but just quickly, when it comes to work in the courts, 
there is a substance and then there is a procedure. The procedure is equally as important as the substance. So um, the, the lawyers are those who are usually well versed with the procedure. So a case can be won or lost even on procedure only. So it depends on the context in which maybe the comment was made because uh, a case can easily be won on procedure as to when you file a document, as to when uh, a certain intervention is made. Several things can go into it which has no relation or bearing with the merits or substance of the case. Thank you. Yes, I was, I was struck. I'm David Okuma from Calvin College, visiting lecturer here. I was struck by the, the striking parallel between the relationship between magistrate and witness, which is facilitated by the interpreter, and the relationship between a chief and a member of the community facilitated by a linguist, uh, with two very striking differences. One, uh, it may often not involve linguistic translation. If I'm speaking with an Ewe or a chief, of course, it does involve linguistic translation. Uh, but for members of the community, the language does not change, and nevertheless, there is the necessity of someone to interpret in both directions. And the other difference is that the linguist is expected uh, to use his own experience to add uh, necessary qualifications, nuances. The linguist is expected not to translate literally what the community member says or what the chief says, but to translate in some cases, what the chief should have said, or the community member meant to say. So uh, it strikes me then that perhaps part of the training for interpreters in Ghanaian courts should be, remember, you are an interpreter, not an Ochami. <laughs> <laughs> the defendant can also have a lawyer, presumably. So if the defendant has a lawyer, that is also another line of translation from the lawyer to the defendant. So what, how, how do these two lines of Communications work. And presume, okay, so, so that's one scenario. Another scenario, the defendant doesn't have a, a lawyer, and then they're dependent upon the, the uh, translator, the interpreter. So, can you comment on those two different scenarios? The work of the interpreter is quite complex. Now, in the case where the defendant has a lawyer, there is a lawyer who is speaking for the uh, for the defendant. But then, because the um, because the lawyer speaks English, okay, so then there is no need for any interpretation. So that is, if the lawyer is speaking for either the plaintiff or the defendant, then there's no need for interpretation. <coughs> but it is when the witness decides, although maybe he can speak English, he decides to speak in his mother <coughs> tongue, then there must be interpretation. So right at the beginning of the proceedings, um, the the court clerk would find out what language the witness wants to speak, or wants to use. If the lawyer who is talking for them, then no problem. It's direct. It's just English. But where there's no lawyer, then the other the plaintiff or the witness or the defendant would have to decide the language he wants to use. Then it becomes quite complex because the interpreter has to listen to the witness, get back to the magistrate, and then from the magistrate back to the witness or the defendant or whatever. And all these they, they requires that the interpreter is very alert and emotionally balanced, you know, to be able to do all these things uh, perfectly. And then, um, yes, the work of the Ochiami is very different from that of the interpreter. Now, the, the court interpreter is only a country. You're not supposed to add or, or subtract anything just to present. So, um, yeah, so that is that. But for the Ochiami, there could be embellishment, there could be addition or whatever. And the case of the Ochiami too, the language most of the time is just one. Okay, just one, but in the courts, 
there are several languages that the um, interpreter has to to work with. Any other? I think we'll take the last round uh, of questions and then go in. Just a follow up on an earlier question about uh, terminology. Um, there are a lot of works that are out there, one entitled Account Terminology by uh, Professor Ajikum Osam and uh, Mr. Pintin Saki. There's Akan Kasa Murani Kasa Swap by um, Asim Kwesi Bwedi, where all various color terms are given about 20 or more with examples of the colors. I'm, I'm wondering about dissemination because there are so many works that have a lot of technical terms, scientific terms, and so forth and so on, but I find that a lot of people just aren't aware of them. So in terms of recommendations with dissemination of things that are already there and there are copious examples of these things, how do you think possibly these things can be woven into legal proceedings, medical proceedings, things of that nature? Well, thank you very much. I'm interested in looking at the, the perception of the truth when maybe a witness comes and speaks English to defend somebody and a witness comes and speaks a local language to defend somebody. Was there like a perception or, I mean, the, the vibe in the courtroom that this guy is, is likely to be speaking more truth because he came to defend somebody in English language or um, somebody is defending somebody in, in, in Chi or in Ghana? What, what was the vibe? And I, 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 I'm sure, I'm speaking from a point of ignorance, I think we don't have a jury system in Ghana. So it would be interesting if we did have a jury system, how people would react when somebody comes to defend a witness speaking Chi and somebody comes to defend, uh, let's say, a, a church or driver speaking Ghana. The perception of who is telling the truth. Problem. This was supposed to be one of the tasks that the various language committees of the Bureau of Ghana Languages which I don't believe they're still, I haven't heard anything about them for a long time, but I would suggest that perhaps the revival of that would be, think about that as a recommendation. Um, you said that this uh, presentation is part of your academic exercise, so I just want to make a couple of uh, recommendations for your future academic work. Uh, number one, I think, uh, the uh, suggestions from, from the group is very important, mentioning Kwesi Yanka's work. Kwesi Yanka actually referenced a previous work in which cultural competence was a factor in swaying uh, final judgments. In other words, the use of proverbs. Um, I think uh, Campbell mentioned the fact that there might be a relationship between uh, uh, interpretation and uh, outcome of a judgment. So that was a, that was a <coughs> case. That the John Messenger's work on the use of programs in courts. So, in other words, the ethnography of speaking, uh, the poetics of translations, poet, poetics of interpretation, and how these interface <coughs> with the whole idea of dialogic relations between translation and interpretation. Uh, carrying the work to that level, I think you also need to address the basic works on rhetoric, beginning with, say, Pintillian, ideas of uh, rhetoric. Uh, focusing on their social ethics. Today we talk about social construction. Uh, Wood is an, an ideal speaker or interpreter. We need to go back to criteria. And uh, Rispaco's paradigm of persuasion. Again, uh, the, the framework of persuasion was taken up by John Messenger in his research work in which the proverb was cited as one of the ways of dissuading or persuading judgment. Uh, finally, I think. Uh, your methodology is very, very interesting, especially in the case of how we were able to keep the memory and go back to the car and write down things because there's you know, issues of sensitivity. So in other words, your methodology can contribute to the way we approach sensitive topics in a certain context. And there are some strategies you can use. Uh, I'm not sure if but the courts routinely video record proceedings. And you can go back to a translator's records, for example. So I think those are quick comments on this one. Thanks. Okay, I think we'll um, answer these questions and then move. Okay, um, yeah. Dr. Pambon, you spoke about the dissemination of the, the words of, yeah, of 
I think it all boils down to training. If we can organize or mount some training programs, that would help. But I also believe that these works would have to be published and made available to the various professional bodies. Okay, I think if we did that, that would also help. With the uh, handbook for interpreters, for instance, it's amazing that um, as I spoke to some of them, as I interviewed some interpreters, they know about it, but they don't even have it. You know, it's a very simple book. I got it and then I made a copy. I mean, as simple as that. But some of them, although they know about it, they don't have it. And um, I was, one of them told me that, oh, it's on the registrar. Not only the registrar doesn't, the court registrar doesn't need that book. You know? The interpreter who needs the book. So, it's important that we make some of these works available. Try to let them have those concerns, have them. And then what we can do is to mount uh, programs or courses to help them. They may say they don't have the money, but are we after money? It's not money that we always want. We always want to go after. So we can help you know, by mounting courses for them. I mean, to, to train them to do better. Yes. Um, what else? I think the rest are just. Um, Comment. Uh, but I'll see you later for some more details. <laughs> um, yeah, some of these spoke about a lawyer speaking chi. Sorry, a lawyer speaking chi. I think you respect the witness or something. The witness does not defend. Let me start by saying that. So, um, and now in Ghana, the language for recording in our courts is English. Okay, so the lawyer is expected to communicate with the magistrate or the, the, or the judge in English and not in any Ghanaian language. So that is the official language of the courts. The question was that Glossia is one accorded more status, like if a witness comes and speaks English versus one who's only speaking quote unquote a local language? No, in the courts I, I know that in Ghana all uh, Ghanaian languages have um, at least in the courts, they all have the same status. Although there are nine official languages, nine Ghana, um, government sponsored languages, these languages are what we normally use as um, media of instruction in our schools. But when it comes to the courts, I think that there are no preferences. You know, any language at all is accorded the, the uh, recognition that it deserves. They all have the same status in our courts. I think the chairman wants to ask. Okay. I believe you are right. Um, then I think it's where the, we should give Dr. Abdul a round of applause. <laughs> Before I uh, summarize briefly, I think the question that she answered last uh, was really as to the level of credibility that is attached to a person giving evidence, whether uh, if a person comes as a witness and gives evidence in plea, the person is deemed to be more credible, and therefore uh, the, the level of veracity that's attached to uh, his evidence it should be higher than somebody who is in that country. Generally, uh, all court officials, whether you are an interpreter, whether you are a lawyer, or the magistrate or judge, they're supposed to be impartial. So that level of impartiality should permeate all spheres, uh, irrespective of the language that is being used. So it is not expected to be the case. Um, from practice and from experience, um, things do happen, but usually language use uh, or the language in which a person testifies uh, usually does not influence um, the level of credibility that's attached to the person's evidence. Um, she did the research, so she has more personal information on that. Um, then I think uh, it's very good the academic twist that you added to the discussion, um, Aristotle's uh, discussions on uh, persuasion and all that. I think that those are very good and very excellent. But given the research that she did, um, the, the critical criteria for in 
concreted is that they should be very precise, very accurate, should not embellish whatever is said. So uh, what you said, and I think what was said earlier about the Ghanaian or Chiamme, the use of progress and architect in language, fits into the prosecution of the case itself. So if the lawyer or even the accused person or even the person seeking the legal proceeding uh, is added in those languages, it helps in the persuasion uh, that he can impress upon the court to more or less the court to inside. But when it comes to the interpreters, they are not supposed to double into the use of progress. Whatever the person has said, just interpret that. You should be as far as possible, uh, no personal emotional attachment. Uh, as it were, and I think she has dealt with it uh, very brilliantly. But thanks so much for that. I think she will see you for that and then uh, to make more, the people more strong. So with that said, I think we've had the opportunity to be treated to a very interesting research, uh, which is also very important. Uh, important in the sense that it's provided for in the Constitution, affects human rights, and uh, we believe We've learned a lot as to the qualifications of interpreters, the duties that they're supposed to perform in the court, um, the language repertoire, at least from the sample uh, uh, that was the research was conducted on, the demographics, the challenges that they face, uh, and the need for training, and several other things. But let me highlight that um, the handbook um, is actually available, even in PDF version, online. So uh, as the research shows, it seems some of the people actually, uh, I don't want to say they are lazy, but um, a little search can at least put the, the handbook even on your phone or uh, at your desktop. Um, and uh, the JTI, the Judicial Training Institute, um, as part of the recruitment processes, uh, they, after the interview, the briefing, and the assessment and everything, they take the interpreters and other course that they are recruiting through an orientation and uh, training process. So I think that is also something that the recommendation can focus on that. In that process of orientation, some of these things should be highlighted. But I think it is something that is very important because the handbook was actually uh, published in 2011. And prior to that, there was no comprehensive handbook for interpreters. So it's something very recently that has been published and they are yet to get to more of it, especially those have been in the system for a long time. So, Dr. Mrs. Akufiyansa, thank you so much for uh, the, this research and for the information you shared with us. And to the uh, participants and the audience, thank you so much for coming. We are most grateful. All right, uh, one more big round of applause for Dr. Mrs. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, really an interesting paper, and uh, I think one of the best things is that it can have implications on the grounds for uh, so many people in their lives. I also attended the same conference where this idea came up, and I'm glad that she pursued you know, this topic so that we can get more funds to travel to further conferences and <laughs> justification. Uh, but on a serious note, uh, very good job. And give yourselves a big round of applause for also coming out. We have a few announcements. Um, we have the uh, qu uh, Quality of Life uh, project. We will have all stakeholders, all of those who are participating to meet immediately after the seminar. Uh, also this evening, we have a, a film showing of Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash talking about uh, those Africans who are in the Gullah Sea Islands off of Georgia and South Carolina, and that will be coming on at 6. Also, we have uh, the African Presidential Papers and Libraries Project uh, from Professor Gordon. Uh, you can see him for more information or also for brochures. And finally, next week, we have another very interesting topic by Dr. Ebenezer Aisu, uh, Gendered Iniquities, Aphrodisiac, Sex, and Labor Relations in Ghanaian History. And we once again appreciate everyone for coming out. We look forward to seeing you here in the same place, at the same time, next week. Thanks.